music in the air. Oh, when Ooh. the world is silent, I hear music in the air. Oh, when the world is silent, I hear music in the air. There must be a God somewhere.
Good morning. I'm Pastor Steve Potate Marshall, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to online worship at the Atascadero United Methodist Church. Today is Holy Communion Sunday, and so we will be celebrating communion virtually. So I invite you to get some wine or grape juice and a cup, and also some bread, and have that on standby so that you can participate with communion when the time comes. Also note that there will be links below to our website and to how you can register your attendance and submit a prayer request and do your online giving. We're so grateful that you're with us and welcome to worship. sings the Father's song. He calls the Son to wake the dawn, and from the course of day, till evening falls in crimson rays. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, His breath upon the space. Use the land and sky. 
It is Dorwin Johnson and Stephanie Yerchak with the call to worship. We hear the voice of one who calls to us to come and find rest. We come burdened with much, but will heed the voice of Jesus. We have much to learn from him and he will give us all that we need. May we be made ready to receive the yoke of Christ and empowered to live in it. I am Mary Beth, and this is our opening prayer. O oh God, you are rich in forgiveness, and for this you assumed the way of our flesh. Make us steadfast in all our struggles. Grant that we might always hold fast to the good things which we receive from you, and that as often as we fall into sin, may we be raised up by repentance. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. It's Carrie again. It's the children's moment for all you children, young and old. I really miss you. Still do a lot. I hope everyone is staying safe and wearing their masks and really taking care of each other. That is really important right now. So the children's moment today is another story. It includes Abraham, but mostly it's about Isaac and how Abraham found Isaac a wife. It's in the Old Testament. It's in Genesis still. Genesis 24 is where it starts. And um, this is the story, like I said, of Isaac and Rebecca. Isaac was getting old enough to get married now and Abraham decided it was time. In those days, Abraham, or the parents of the adult children, decided who they would marry and when they would marry. I'm glad that's not the case now, but in the olden days it was. That was important to them. But the parents had that decision. But Abraham wanted Isaac's wife to come from their homeland, where they originally came from, and that is a place called Mesopotamia. There's Abraham, and there's Mesopotamia. Looks a little barren, but it was where they were from. He thought that he really needed to find a wife for Isaac from where they came from, because he knew that the people up there really believed in God and really loved God as well. So he asked his servant that he trusted the most to go to the homeland and find Isaac a wife. Now that was a lot of trust because he was trusting in God that Isaac would find a good wife. He was trusting in the servant, that servant would help that. And um, so there was a lot of trust for God there. He went and the servant traveled from here where they were all the way back to his homeland, way up there. It was a long way to go. In the olden days, they didn't have cars, they didn't have buggies. He did ride camels and he brought what's called a dowry with him. And the dowry could be made up of camels, jewelry, clothes, presents for the future wife's family. There were camels that the servant brought. There was jewelry that the servant brought. And part of what a dowry was for is to show the wife's family or the future wife's family how important she was to the groom, how important she was, and that they recognized that the wife's family was giving up the wife and that it was so important that they were willing to give them presents because they wanted to show how much they respected the wife or the future wife. So he travels, the servant travels all the way up to where Abraham told him to go. Now here's the thing, the servant didn't know who he was going to find, how he was going to find this wife for Isaac. He didn't know anything. So he sat down next to a well and he starts to pray and he says, God, please help me find the best wife for Isaac. He had an idea. He said, if women come to the well, I'm going to ask them to please give me some water. 
and if they agree to give me some water, and then they also look at all my camels and offer to give them water as well, and camels drank a lot, that would mean that would be the woman for Isaac, that she was generous and caring to strangers. So that's exactly what happened. Rebecca came to the well and Isaac's servant or Abraham's servant asked if he could have water. She said yes. And then she offered to feed or water the um, camels as well. And that was a big, generous offer back then. Uh, Abraham's servant knew that he had found the right person, Rebecca. He asked to go to her family. He told her family what he wanted. He gave Rebecca some of the jewelry. Her family said, Rebecca, are you willing to do this? And Rebecca said, I trust God and I am willing to go. Now she didn't know whether she'd ever see her family again, but she was willing to do this. So they went and traveled all the way back to where Abraham and Isaac were. And Isaac met Rebecca and knew immediately that she was exactly the wife that he needed. And so he got down and told her how much she cared for her and how wonderful their life was going to be. And again, there was a lot of trust between Isaac, between Abraham, Rebecca trusted God, the servant trusted God. It was really a lot of trust. So it's important to remember that everyone in the story believed that God would provide would help them make the right choices and decisions. and they But they didn't just sit there. Remember, they all went out and did something. They trusted that they were gonna listen and let God lead them, but they also acted. That's important to know too. Don't just sit around and say, God will do it. You have to know that you have to go out there and move forward and listen to what to do through God and knowing the right decisions to make. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these wonderful stories you have given us in the Bible to show us your love, your willingness to help us when we listen and let you lead us. Every day we are learning to have faith in you and take action through listening doing the right thing, and caring for everyone around us. Amen. And we are about to enter a time of confession. The United Methodist Church is going through a time of discernment and confession around the issue of racism and how we as individuals, as a church, as the world, have participated in perpetuating racism throughout all of the world. So this confessional prayer is centered on helping us come to some sense of uh, repentance for this participation. So I invite you to join with me in this call to confession. For all the ways we colonize each other with expectations, beliefs, judgments, and our own fears, God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we squander right relationship, grabbing to have more while some go without. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we abuse our freedom, engaging hateful speech that injures and demeans. God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. For all the ways we deny equality, deeming some in and some out, God, in your mercy, forgive and transform. All the ways we have refused to let go of privilege, whining about how hard it is to change our ways, our systems, our lifestyles, God, in your mercy, forgive and transform.
words of assurance. Jesus said, I have come to set the prisoner free. No matter what binds you this day, freedom is yours through new life in Christ. If it is your blinders that imprison you, be free in Christ of, of this ignorance. If it is your entitlement and excuses that tell you that letting go will be a prison for you, be free in Christ of this self-serving lie. If it is your fear of losing yourself that immobilizes you, be free in Christ of this false ego. We will continue to make mistakes, but the biggest one would be not to heed the call to try and try again. And so, in the name of him who comes to loose the chains, you are forgiven. In, in the, the name, name of Jesus Christ, Christ you, you are forgiven, set, set free to try, try again. again. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. When our lives are set free, we are able to reach out to strangers and friends. I invite you to pass the peace of Christ amongst you, saying, Freedom is coming. Yes, I do. I'm Heather Young, the Communications Director for the Church. Today's Old Testament reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 24, verses 34 through 38, 42 through 49, and 58 through 67. Abraham's trusted servant addressed Rebekah's family, saying, I work for Abraham, and he has sent me here. The Lord has set my boss up very nicely. He has become a very wealthy mad man with huge holdings of livestock, investments in silver and gold, a large workforce, and convoys of transport animals. My boss and his wife, Sarah, became the parents of a son in their old age, and they have signed over their entire fortune to him. My boss has given me the job of finding a suitable wife for his son, but he made me promise that I would not let him marry one of the local Kenite girls. Instead, he sent me to find a wife for his son from here among his own relatives. So when I pulled up at the water hole today, I prayed that the God of my boss would put me here on the right track. I said, Oh Lord, I have arrived here at this water hole where the young women come to collect water. I will ask the first one who comes for a drink and she will offer me a drink and offer to draw water for my camels as well. Lord, let her be the one you have chosen to be the bride of my boss's son. Even before I finished my prayer, Rebecca came out to fill her water container. After she had gone to the water hole and collected her water, I asked her for a drink. Without hesitation, she offered me a drink from her water container and then offered to draw more water for my camels. So I accepted the drink and she watered my camels. Then I asked her whose daughter she was and she told me that her father was Bethuel, the son of Nahor and Michael. I knew then that she came from among my boss's relatives, so I put on her the ring and the jewelry he had sent. Then I bowed my head and gave, gave thanks to the Lord, the God whom my boss Abraham worships. 
The Lord has put me on the right track so that I can find a suitable wife for his boss's son, for my boss's son, from among his own people. Now then, let me know whether you will do the right thing by my boss, or if not, tell me straight so that I will know which way to turn. So the family called Rebecca and asked her, Are you willing to go with this man? Man, I am, she said. So they farewelled their sister Rebecca and sent her off with Abraham's servant and his drivers. They also sent with her the family servant who had been her childhood nanny. They gave Rebecca their blessing, saying to her, Sister, may you become the mother of millions. May your descendants triumph in everything they do. With that, Rebecca and the servant girls who were going with her got up and were seated on the camels. They set off, following Abraham's servant as he headed for home. Mission accomplished. Now Isaac was living in the southern part of Canaan, near the water hall called the Eye of God. One evening, as he was out walking to unwind at the end of the day, he looked up and saw the convoy of camels approaching. Rebecca saw him in the distance and quickly slipped off her camel and asked the servant, Who is that man coming toward us? The servant replied, That's him, Master Isaac. So she made herself ready with her veil over her face. The servant told Isaac all about the success of his mission. Then Isaac met Rebekah and took her home, and she became his wife. As a new leading woman of the tribe, she was given the home that had belonged to Isaac's late mother, Sarah. Isaac loved Rebekah greatly, and she was a comfort to him as he grieved the death of his mother. This ends our reading. Romans seven fifteen to 25 Sometimes I can't make head nor tail of my own behavior. I want to do what is right, but instead I find myself doing things I absolutely despise. Even as I do them, I am telling myself I don't want to. Clearly then, I know they are wrong, so I am not trying to excuse myself by arguing that the law is stupid. The fact is that I don't have what it takes to control everything I do. Somewhere inside me, sin has corrupted the system. When I look inside myself and see the selfish desires that live there, I know they are all rotten to the core. While I have no trouble making up my mind to do what is right, I still can't do it. I fail to follow through on my good intentions and instead find myself doing, exact, doing something crooked, the exact thing I wanted so much to avoid. Now, if what I actually do is not what I am intending to do, then clearly I have lost control of what I am doing. Something inside me, namely sin, is sabotaging the system and wreaking havoc. So, in my experience, it seems to be an inescapable fact of life that when I intend to do what is good, corruption is lying in wait, ready to sneak under my guard. God's instruction on how we should live appeal to me greatly. I love them with all my heart and mind. So the various parts of me are receiving the right instructions from my mind. But I experience another set of instructions trying to override them. I can see that my body is being controlled by a crippling addiction to sin. How completely and utterly screwed up I am. Is there anybody who can set me free from the addiction that has such a deadly grip on my body? Thank God there is. Jesus the Messiah, our Lord, can set us free. I am the church. You are the church. We are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. The church is not a building, the church is not a steeple, the church is not a resting place, the church is a people. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. We're many kinds of people with many kinds of faces, all colors and all ages too, from all times and places. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. Sometimes the church is marching, sometimes it's bravely burning, sometimes it's riding, sometimes hiding, always it's learning. I am the church, 
you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. And when we cannot gather, there's still singing and there's praying, there's still laughing and there's crying too, and all of it saying, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. At Pentecost, some people received the Holy Spirit and told the good news through the world to all who would hear it. I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All who follow Jesus all around the world, yes, we're the church together. So growing up in New England, July 4th is a big deal there. I lived in one of the original 13 colonies that broke away from England. There are reminders of that cost of freedom, as well as all the efforts it took to form a new country wherever you go in New England. Today, for example, if you're in Boston, you can walk the Freedom Trail to learn of the history of the founding of the United States. The Freedom Trail, as advertised, is a 2.5 mile Rick, red brick trail leading through Boston neighborhoods that tells the story of freedom. That it, as you take that walk, which I've done several times, you go through places like Old North Church, Faneuil Hall, King's Chapel, Paul Revere's home. All of these exhibits have stories to tell about the winning of independence from England and of birthing a new country. Now, more recently, there has been established a Black Heritage Trail, and it's a walking tour of Boston's 19th century Afro-American's uh, journey focusing on the black community of the 1800s and their leading efforts in the abolition movement and the Underground Railway. Now, each of these routes tell a story, each important, but one that's often more highlighted in history than the other. I was not always taught in school about the role of the black community and obtaining freedom for slaves. Not as many field trips to the sacred sites as the other freedom trail, but plenty I experienced details about Paul Revere's ride, the Boston Tea Party, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In this, here in this church in Atascadero, we have made the commitment to welcome all to God's table. We are a reconciling congregation, a welcoming member of the LGBTQ community, where they and all of us can come together to the table where all are welcome. And we learn about God's love for all and how we're all worthy in God's sight. We are called to be advocates for injustice and work for freedom for all. And the scriptures from Romans, Paul reminds us that even when we've made this commitment to do right, to welcome, to love, to work for justice, we often find ourselves frustrated by our own efforts. Sometimes our actions are contrary to those lofty goals. Instead of loving, we become, in Paul's words, captive to the cause of sin. Something inside me, namely sin, is sabotaging the system and wrecking havoc. We're not born racists or having prejudice, 
but somehow we learn how to discriminate based maybe in our sinful nature, primarily at least. And that somehow convinces us that being unfair, not taking into account the freedom of all people, that our love has to be proportioned to only those who look and talk like us. Paul is aware of this in himself. And we're reminded in this moment that Paul was the same Paul who persecuted Christians in the past, who used power and influence to persecute and track them down, even kill the very community he was now preaching to. He gets a second chance, and aren't we richer for it? God redeems his son, and he is free then to preach and teach, and he humbly follows God's commands now in this second life that he lives. Now, not all freedom in our country is experienced equally. Not all have access to health care or education or housing, the joy of raising a family in a safe neighborhood, working a quality job. Now, our response to this knowledge and all that's been said about racism, prejudice, and how we participate in it if we're not working for the solution, we're part of the problem, all of those things that are said, these can cause us sometimes to feel guilty and shameful. But it's not just all about that emotion, those emotions. It's also using this opportunity to open our hearts and our minds and our souls to the life-giving love of God, who has the power to redeem the world, redeem even our actions and thoughts that have led us down the wrong path. The life-giving love of God will take us on a journey that will fulfill the hope of those who are oppressed and bring freedom to the captives. Now we've been following the story of Abraham and Sarah, Hagar and Ishmael, and today Isaac and Rebekah are featured. And today we hear specifically about Rebekah and her story and how she comes to marry Isaac. The story, of course, is rich in detail and substance, and so it's hard to concentrate on all of it. So I'm just focusing on one piece of it. When Rebecca is asked, are you willing to go with this man? This is a man she just met, a man who comes from a different part of the world, a man who will take her away from all that she's known, her land, her family, her friends. All of this is so risky. But what does Rebecca say? How does she answer? She says, I will. She takes upon the journey with faith because she does follow God. She does marry Isaac and he and brings him comfort and love and he loves her. So it's a happy ending for their love story. I am surprised, I'm struck by their witness, specifically uh, Rebecca's witness and how God calls us this day to often leave behind our old way of living that's caused so much pain to ourselves and others. To leave behind the war in our minds that makes us captive to sin. Leave behind the laws and attitudes that lead to inequality and oppression. We're called to set upon a new journey, take a new path so that we can bring love and comfort to those who mourn. As I grew up in going to July 4th fireworks shows, what touched me most growing up was when the parade would end and we would gather in the cemetery to pay honor to all of those who had given their lives up for my freedom, for your freedom. When we ended that ceremony with taps being played on the bugle, and then the 21-gun salute, 
It was a sobering moment in the midst of celebrating. We took a moment to appreciate the freedom that was given to us and because of the sacrifice of others, still made it possible for us to live with freedom. As I grow older, I have gained more appreciation for many more who've worked for freedom, perhaps in a different way than going to war. I think of Harriet Tubman, who worked for freedom by establishing an underground railway so slaves could escape and start a new life, a tireless advocate for those who were suffering. I have preached those who, uh, appreciate those who marched for civil rights, and I know there are several in my, our congregation who have done that. There are those who have marched for a women's right to vote, immigration reform, and all of these efforts are to help Americans become free. So the question for us is the same as it was for Rebecca. Will you go? Will you work for freedom so all God's people will be united together, free from the burdens of oppression and sin? Will you walk the path that leads to freedom for all across the globe so all will be able to live free? Howard Thurman, who is the Dean of Marsh Chapel at Boston University back in the 1940s, wrote many meditations and sermons, some of which inspired Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who attended Boston University School of Theology as a PhD candidate and would go to chapel and hear Howard Thurman preach. So I would like to close today with this thought about, that he has about love and the persistence of life. Love hoped all things, endured all things. The contradictions of experience confuse and confound. Tides of beauty caught in an undertow of slime. Goodness, luminous, refined, manacled by evil, no hand can stay, love ripe, full, stalked by hate that binds and chokes, hope leaping clear from peak to peak, haunted by echoes of despair, the contradictions of experience confuse, confound. Which is the true, the sure, the real? The final vote of man's spirit, what does it say? Is there eternal drama here, endless and interval, whole in itself? Is the tension only shadow, a trick of the mind, a whimper of the heart, and nothing more? The closing vote, what does it say? The contradictions are final? Never. The growing edge of hope remains when all the voices of despair are stilled. Love persists when hate no longer holds. Goodness triumphs, though evil struggles to the end. All this man's spirit says. The dogmas of the minds are afterthoughts. So let the winds blow. Let the torrents fume. Let the night wax in darkness. Let death be death. Life will not die. Life holds and grows. Amen. Welcome to this table where we'll celebrate Holy Communion. All are welcome to come and to celebrate this life-giving experience of Jesus and of God and of the Holy Spirit. So let us join in the great thanksgiving. The liberating God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts with joy. We lift them up to God. Let us give thanks to the author of freedom. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing to give praise to you this day, liberator of humankind. You unleashed your creative power and a world blossomed. 
You bestowed upon every living thing life and breath, color and movement. No matter how many battles we wage within and between ourselves and against you, your promised vision and gift of peace and abundance continues. And so we lift our voices in celebration of you. Holy, holy, holy are you. We join in all the prophets and saints. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. We join in the parade of justice. Blessed Blessed are they they who come come in the name of the Lord. We add our cries and exclamations. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus. To those who were imprisoned by status, law, race, origin, illness, poverty, gender, age, disease, he said, your belief has set you free. You are a child of God. He invited disciples, friends, and strangers alike to his tables. He took bread. He proclaimed God's grace to all, to all with whom he broke bread. He proclaimed God's love to all whom he shared the cup. And he told us to remember, repeating after me, freedom has come. Freedom is coming. Holy Spirit, transform this meal, transform this body, so that we might be free to love without condition and bite without hesitance, go without reservation, and proclaim your freedom to all the world. And let the people say, Amen. Take and eat the bread of life. Share now the cup of salvation. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. I am Esther Halsey. We want to offer you this moment to give of your tithe and offering. There is a link to our online giving in the comments, and you're always welcome to send a check to the church. Thank you for giving faithfully so we can continue to offer God's word to our virtual congregation. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for coming to us as a gentle king and bring in us victory over sin and death. Make us more and more like you, humble and gentle, and serving others. Amen. Join me in this benediction. The church is not a resting place. It is a place where we do come and we find nourishment for our souls and for our bodies for our spirits. We're inspired by one another and the faith that God gives us. But finally, we are to go back into the world, bring the light and the good news that love wins and that all are welcome at God's table and to work then for justice and peace and equality 
in everything we do and everything we say. So go now with the power of God, our creator of Jesus Christ, our savior and the Holy Spirit and march onward into freedom. Amen.